Hello, and welcome to the Movie Brightly podcast. My name's Tom. I'm here with my co-host, Blaine. Hi, Blaine. Hello. Together, we have over 32 years of combined experience in the creative industry, and it hasn't been easy. We've had to put in long hours, climb the ranks, and do the jobs nobody wanted to do, all in hopes of one day living our dreams of living creative lives, with creative careers. But you know what we discovered? Living the creative life you always wanted isn't all it's cracked up to be. Every day is full of inspiration, creative problem solving, and that can lead to burnout. This podcast explores the way in which top people in the creative industry move forward in a career they love while finding new ways to infuse creativity into their lives and work and keep that creative passion alive. Join us weekly as we have those conversations and walk away with nuggets we could all use to stave off burnout and continue to produce better and better work. And also just come hang out with us because it's going to be fun. That type this of thing. is also turning into something I'm not sure is usable, but let's let's just keep going at this no, point. This is, this is great. So today is it's the 24th. My birthday was yesterday. I just turned 38. Happy birthday! Hey, let's talk about the birthday I spent with you. That's fun. That's a fun little story. Uh, Magna Ball. Magna Ball. Magna Ball. We did a fish festival. Fish the band with H in Watkins Glen. New York. Mm -hmm. This was my 30th birthday, too. It was a big one. Has it been that long? Yeah. Eight years ago, 2015. Wow. We we went to a weekend fish festival, like three night thing. And my birthday was on the last day of the show. Me and our mutual friend, Johnny Mack, who shares the same birthday as me. And Mm -hmm. I had uh, rented a room, I think, with my brother and a buddy of mine. Ian. Mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. All staying Ian. In a room. Yeah, we were all staying in a room together. And then that day, my dad showed up kind of on a motorcycle. I will motorcycle. never forget that. Your dad right. just rolls in on a motorcycle, yeah. my motorcycle. And I'm like, this is your dad. And like, honestly, no offense. I was like, he's cooler than you are. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. he's not, but in that moment, he looked so cool. And so cool. I, I even told him, he took me out to lunch, me and my brother and, and my buddy. And I told him, like, all my friends were gushing about you. Because he he was in Utah and he drove from Utah. He was on his way back to New England, where he was living at the time. And he drove from Utah to New York, upstate, to make it to take me out to lunch on my birthday, which was a very incredibly sweet gesture. And so, like, he's unshaven. He's wearing, like, all leather. He's got this huge, like, BMW motorcycle or something. It was, like, a massive bike that he has, yeah. like, apartments on and stuff. So it's it's huge. And he's, like, all in leather. He looks kind of, like, dirty and unkempt. And he's just this, like, 60 or 50, at the time, like, 57-year-old guy coming into this fish village of all these, like, rich, hippie pieces of shit myself included and you no offense <laughs> yeah, um okay. and, and he I just kind of shows up and he's like how's it going good to see all you guys how's everybody doing over here like in his thick boston accent yeah and i looked around and i'm like every woman in this restaurant right now has a huge crush on my dad sure every single one like not just yeah. our group of friends yeah but, well, i don't know if there... you remember that there was that incident that same morning Right? The partying. Like, the partying in the breakfast the restaurant. Room. Yeah. yeah. And people not got by it. us. Not by not us. By, we're no. we're considerate. We're we're very of this powerful. community. Yeah. But yeah, people were like doing Coke and nitrous or something like that, like just openly in the restaurant. And they were like, You guys gotta leave. You can't we're they still they were gonna call the police. Yeah, we're still a business here. Yeah. And I told I told my dad that after he picked me up and he was like, So is that like what you guys do? <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, yes, but no, no, not like that. You know. Yeah, we're not. We're well. We still have societal awareness. Not me anymore. Yeah, but we were much more, you know, casual back then. But yeah, it was a really fun birthday. You guys all surprised me when I was out to lunch, and you decorated my moat cabin room, motel room, whatever it was, with a bunch of like birthday supplies and stuff. So. so- to just give full credit there that was danny's idea 
and we were just chilling and she was like, I'm going to go over to Walmart, get stuff for Tom's birthday. And I was like, I want to do that. And then I don't know if it was her or me, but we got the birthday girl sash, which yeah. I really liked. Okay. Yeah, it was very thoughtful of Danny and I just piggybacked it. Yeah, I remember me leaving to get lunch and she ran up to the car and was like, can I have your room key? And I just, I, it just, I, I don't like connect. I've been surprised before on my birthday in the past and it just doesn't register when it should be like obvious that something's happening. So she asked me that and I was kind of like all suspicious of her. <laughs> it's like, what the hell do you want in my room? the least suspicious person yeah when you need to like go drop a secret deuce or something like what are you trying to do in the room no and then she had to ask again and i was like okay sure just no conception at all of that she was trying to do something nice for me (laughs) i'm just always wary i'm never never willingly accept the fact that like someone could be just doing something nice i'm like what's your angle you know one time my ex-girlfriend <clears throat> surprised me when I we were both living in New York on my birthday she got all of my family who was living in a different state to come to New York for my birthday and she told me we were going to go out to dinner and we went out to dinner and my family was just sitting there at a table and I remember my reaction was like oh my god what's going on my reaction was just like huh <laughs> like it didn't track and I remember thinking like my family got reservations here too. Like I did not understand that it was for me that that's why they were all there. And that's why this whole thing was happening. And even like her mom flew up from Mexico for it and stuff. And then I was like, Oh man, pressure's on. Yeah. Speaking of your family, uh, I somehow ran across your sister who we've talked about before her Instagram profile and, oh, I think it might be because she's one of the like three people who follows Move Me Brightly. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so I followed her back. You know, I love her. And I think I discovered some photos of Tony. Oh, yeah? It's, it's a sort of like a Where's Waldo uh-huh. type situation. And I was like, oh, he looks just like him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it might not be him, but if it's not. Yeah. Yeah. We look a lot alike. Mm -hmm. I'm slightly taller. I'm significantly larger, rounder, I guess. Um, Which is weird because I'm the the little brother in that duo. But yeah, Tony. The enigmatic Tony. Who's also turning 40 this year. We got to have him on. Doesn't matter what he does. (sighs) <laughs> I mean, sure, I would love it. I would love to just talk to him, but I don't think he really fits the the guest model that we're going for. We'll get my entire family on one at a time. Uh, well, speaking of guests, we have someone way more interesting than most of my family members, I would say. Leon Benson was our guest this week. It was a really interesting conversation. Leon is a person who, back in the late 90s, was tried and convicted of murder. He spent 25 years behind bars in prison, over 10 of those years in solitary confinement. And earlier this year in March, he was exonerated for that crime and released. So I know, Blaine, you had a little phone call discussion before we formally asked, <laughs> and we had a really good chat on the podcast. And I think to something that you were saying to me offline earlier, The life that he's lived, spending 25 of his years, which I think is over half his life, I think he's in his late 40s currently, Mm -hmm. is for something that they didn't do. That's a a major caveat, is uh, a worse nightmare situation. I know for myself, and I'm not at all trying to make light of Leon's situation, this is just the truth. I used to be that type of kid who, when I would get my hair cut, I would leave the store and think like, if a crime happens here and they find my DNA on the scene, like, am I going to get in trouble for that? I literally used to have those thoughts a lot. Sure. Yeah. I can totally relate what you were telling me offline. Like that is the ultimate fear of you just get picked up for something you had no involvement in. And 
the system is working against you. Things are not turning in your favor for whatever reason. We get into the reasons a little bit behind why Leon was convicted and what controversies occurred that led to his conviction. But yeah, um, what a what a uniquely interesting perspective he has for someone who has led the kind of life that he has led, been forced to lead the life he's led. Absolutely. And I was so inspired by the way he used creativity to hang on and not lose hope and stay engaged with the community and his community outside of prison and the process of his trial and continuing to fight. He really used creativity as like a a friend in that. And that is very admirable and something that inspired me quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how I would have handled the situation he had been in, but I can only hope I would have used that time as productively as he did. You know, like I'm sure I I, I know how I am and I think I would have spent a lot of that time wallowing and depressed and not up out of bed. And he really seemed to utilize the time that he had in there. He talks a lot about having all this time and time management and how to utilize that to maximize maximize your creativity or your efficiency or education, knowledge base, whatever. Um, he's a really fascinating person. It's a really great chat. And I think y'all are gonna like it. Leon, hi, welcome to the Move Me Brightly podcast. How are you? Hey, I'm doing good. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to really talk to you guys today. Oh, we're thrilled. We're thrilled you're here. It's such an honor. Tom, how you doing? I'm doing good. It's good to meet you, Leon. Um, I am here in Los Angeles. It is a little after 8.15 in the morning. And I was a little late for the podcast. I had a cat puke an emergency. Uh, sidebar, I, I have three cats, Leon, and I took one of them to the vet yesterday, My the girl. I have two boys and a girl. And when she got back from the vet, there was chaos in my house. The two cats were acting like she was an imposter in their home and were hissing at her, trying to fight her. I had to keep them separated. I don't know what it was. I think maybe because she got a bath and they were like what are these foreign smells on you but it was it was bad times and it's still kind of going on this morning so there's a whole if I keep looking to my left it's because I'm checking to make sure there aren't any cat fights that I have to break up now are you sure you brought home the right cat I mean there was a moment last night where I was (laughs) I was like, is this a good, uh, I don't know if either of you ever seen the horror movie, Good Night Mommy, but it's about this mom of two children and she goes in for like a nose job. And when she comes back, the children are convinced that it's not her real mom, that a different woman came home. And it's like this weird head trippy kind of horror movie where you as the audience have to figure out like, was this woman replaced? And I had a moment where I was like, did they good night, mommy, my black cat? <laughs> I'm looking at it because I ha- I took her to the vet mainly just to do a regular checkup, but also she started to get a lot of dandruff on her fur. So I wanted to make sure like she wasn't in pain. She wasn't itching a lot. So I'm like, give her a really good bath, get all that out of her system. And then last night I was kind of like, I and her like, are you my cat? <laughs> I mean, I, I think I would know. I'm pretty sure the way she's acted is normal, but I don't know. The cats, the cats obviously have a better sense of what's going on than humans do. Correct. What if you're just uh, thrown into your own personal horror movie? Like it just I mean, you've watched so many that you're like I mean, it you, just morphs into one. You know me, I would be down with that. I know you would. I know put you me, would. put me in put me in a horror movie. I'm in. <laughs> what's your cat's name? So I have the 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 girl is Hokey, the one who went to the vet, and then oh. I have and then I have two boys named Weirdo and Serlin. Oh, okay. So yeah. I guess you would be like, they clone Hokey, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or did they just swap out one all black cat for another? And um, they're in the back, like, shit. Which one is 
Tom's and which one is Melissa's. We got a 50-50 shot. Let's just go with it. Like they look, they look the same, the way the same, who knows? I mean, she's all black. She's 100% black. So the, if you're a black cat, you look like her. Like there's no, like, there's no markings or stripes or weird, like she's not missing an ear or anything strange like that. She's just generic black cat. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know, but I think, I think we're okay. I think I was telling Blaine <laughs> while I was on the inside, I had a black cat. Oh, you did? Yeah. And the black cat name was Princess. Uh, and hey, hey, this is funny though. So Princess, her, her prior owners, they were some white dudes, right? Some right, some white prisoners, and they had her. And I, I brought Princess over to me because I used to feed her cheese, right? You know what I mean? And and the ongoing joke, you know, the dorm was oh, her name ain't Princess no more. Her name is Black Panther now. <laughs> <laughs> so we was calling her Rakanda, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> How did you get a cat in prison? Well, well, in prison, uh during the latter part of my incarceration, uh I I participated in a program mm -hmm. called Plus Program, and they allow uh other programs to intersect in the dorm. So they had a therapeutic program that allowed prisoners to have cats that would that would have otherwise been laid down. And they allowed them to come in there. They very therapeutic, you know, and then they had a dog program too. So I was in a dorm full of dogs and cats the last two years of uh, my incarceration. So I thought it was very therapeutic because uh, yeah. I had princes like the last 90 days of my incarceration and that was my baby. And matter of fact, I'm trying to make some moves to go down there and rescue Princess. Correct. She should be in prison. You, why not pack your bag and just be like, get in here. Yeah. yeah. We're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> she said she was in prison her whole life. Oh, you know? we gotta bust her out. We got to bust Princess out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> get her yeah. out of there. Definitely. Just like you, man. She's wrongfully convicted. She doesn't deserve to be in there. You know what I mean? Like, get her out of there. Wow. Yeah, I feel bad. I got to go do that. I'm going to get on this week. Well, I mean, wait, I wait, know... Wait, wait, wait. What are the barriers between Princess being a, in prison and Princess being a free Black Does Panther? Princess have visitation rights, basically, is what we're asking. Uh, this, uh, she don't have visitation rights mm -hmm. from anybody on the outside. Uh, I left her with my celly. Uh, it was something odd for him because we was two dog people, right? I never thought like, so I got swayed it to the cat side. Like I, yeah. I, I want a cat more than a dog almost, you know? Uh, but the little process to do it would be me going through the Humane Society of uh, Anderson, Indiana, because it's the closest county uh, to the prison. And then they do the paperwork. It still would take like 90 days to 60 to 90 days for it to happen. Uh, so I, I got to get that process going. That'd I'm be fully, for me, right? Yeah, I'm, no, I'm fully invested in this process. Oh, yeah, you got nothing to lose. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I know Blaine has dogs. I have cats. And I can only speak for me, but I know I live alone. And having cats in my home adds like such a level of love and relaxation to the environment like it just makes everything at minimum 10 percent better sometimes 100 200 better so i can only imagine being in prison locked up in a cell and kind of what connection and bond you can really create with an animal like that like that's got to be really unique and special Oh man, it, it it was really dope. Uh, it introduced me to a world I didn't know exist, the cat world. And uh, I know cats speak a different language. And what I realized, you know, uh, we all speak different languages. I call myself a polyglot. I think I speak different languages, not necessarily linguistic languages, but just the languages of love, spirit, art, you know, and. To see that cat, that cat really made me 
really hone in on the little details. I started to see her dance when she was happy. I started to see her frustrations. It's like I felt it. It seemed like when we looked in each other's eyes, like, I felt seduced, though. I, I, I want to say that. Like, <laughs> I kind of felt seduced. I kind of felt like I was her pet, right, somehow. Yeah. Right? It, it, she was kind of condescending, right? She looked, meal, and I go get her food and everything, right? You know, but I really enjoyed it because you have to get outside yourself to get inside yourself. And having a cat or a dog or even a child or, or somebody that you take care of, it really allows you to take care of yourself a little bit better, you know? Yeah, yeah, 100%. It keeps you responsible for another living thing. And I do think there's that there's that idea with pets specifically, I can't speak about children, but dog, dogs and cats, like there is this thought of, do they even know that they're the pets in this relationship? Because like with a cat, you're the one cleaning out their shit. Like they're just going to shit in the litter box and then they walk away and then they go back the next day and it's completely clean and ready for them again. It's like, who, who actually runs this place, you know? Like 100%, there's that feeling. And there is the thing with cat, with cats, I don't know if you experienced it with Princess, but it sounds like you did when you mentioned being seduced and she would look at you. Like when cats reach a level of trust, they will just stare deep into your soul. Like they will just be sitting there and they will not break eye contact with you for like 15 minutes. And you're like, what are you thinking about right now? That's kind of weird. Hey, yeah. Hey, hey, but I want to say this, right? Hey, so I was sitting in there and it dawned on me. I was like, I am the pet of my pet. I was like, it's true. Pussy run the world, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It doesn't matter what species. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Oh, gosh. All over the place. Oh, gosh. Oh. I have a, a logistics <laughs> question. Obviously, I don't know exactly um, what what kind of prison this is, what kind of cell this is, but based on just in my mind what it would look like, couldn't Princess like slip out and go visit the neighbors? Yeah, do whatever she wants, like go like get into trouble and then she's coming back. Or does she, is there like is she contained with you? So so. So that's a good question. That's a good question, Blaine. You know, in the dorm, it was a dorm of uh, 120 uh, prisoners, a uh, two-man cell. So it was 60 cells in the dorm. And it was a, a significant amount of cats, maybe like uh, probably 30 cats and about 15 dogs, you know, that was in there. And, and when we opened the door, in the place where I was at in the latter part of my incarceration, uh, we had doors, not not straight up cell uh, uh, doors that with bars. We had doors that we can open up, but they locked them for a significant amount of time, you know, throughout the day. But I was in an honor dorm for a little while. Can you believe that? They let That's me get great. in the honor dorm, right? <laughs> I went in the honor dorm, right? I was playing video games. I said, I might as well me play some video games in here, right? And, uh, they allowed our door to be open, you know, all night, but it had to be set during count. But other than that, the door was open. Princess was allowed to go wrong. She had her toys and she come back in. And it seemed like I, I, I bumped into the cat world. When I tell you this, uh, the other cats became jealous of Princess because I, I guess, you know, people pick up on the love, right? Because they normally you don't see like, two black dudes, right? Who, you know, probably got a little persona of, 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 of being thuggy a little bit, you know, real OGs in there and they got a cat, right? You know what I mean? We sit there with a cat and the cat like watching like BT with us, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I really bumped into this world. So like it was times that other cats, I started to pick up on that language. So I come in, I had the bottom bump. And my celly had the upper bunk. So when I come in, I see another cat laying on my bed, right? 
And I used to get on Princess. I'm like, Princess, you a punk. You let people just come and just lay on your bed and everything. You know what I mean? But the cats really start, I guess, picking up on the scent or something or recognizing you was like into the cat world. So she had a big world that she can uh, really play around with. But it was so small. It, it's really a fishbowl to the big world out here that princess could really play in. And uh, you kind of got me feeling sad now. Like, I got to go get princess. got to get princess. We I got mean, to I get just, princess. Yeah, yeah, really. When I get stuck on something, I'm really like, I mean, we're yeah. talking about cats, but like a dog with a bone. So from now on, you'll probably get a daily text from me. Like, where are we on the princess thing? Please, please do. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, yeah, I got to go get princess. <laughs> I can vouch for that. You will be getting daily text from Blaine. Yeah, I really, I'm, you know, when I'm on something, I'm on it. Yeah, we got to she's, do that. She's going to be sending you links and phone numbers like this is who you call. Yeah. This this is the best contact to reach. Like yeah. She oh seems the God. most amenable to helping you out. Sure. That whole yeah, thing. now I'm going to take the sign. I appreciate that. Great. Great. That's All right. That is out. <laughs> so there's a couple of ways that this interview could go. And I believe we should chart the interview out uh together so i didn't you asked me for an outline i failed to send it which is very par for the course for me i like to just sort of sort of i told you i just kind of like to see so people hit so i'm we've covered this in the intro but just as a reminder <clears throat> leon's case was on season three of suspect and he was incarcerated wrongly incarcerated for 25 years for murder and then he was released because of a brady violation which if you're into true crime you know what a brady violation is but it is essentially um the prosecutor withholding information that could uh make the case like null and void right like they're withholding information that if that information came out that it would never would have been tried so it's a it's a massive massive deal to have a brady violation and if you want to we could sort of go into that to your case or we could talk about your time in prison and your time in solitary confinement and how that time fostered your creative spirit and his sort of like that has grown i'd love to talk about that or um, I think those are probably the two main things I want to talk about. And I know that they obviously coincide with one another, but Leon, this is your story that I'm telling. So why don't you, why don't you tell me what, where you want to go? Well, well, I think, I think uh, you can intersect, you know, both of them because here I think it's a great, a great opportunity for me to express to your listeners of the power of creativity you know, even despite, you know, many odds, you know, we use creativity to hurdle, you know, any obstacles. And that would be the case uh, for me. It was the case in the past and it will be the case in the future. So we can use the injustice as a platform to really bounce off of. And I can really share with you, you know, some of my uh, creative perspectives and what really you know, help me, you know, dig deep and find a way to freedom because the creativity isn't something that you just in your mind with and you got this imaginary world, you know, it's about, you know, putting it down on paper, putting it into action, you know, making this plan. So it's an art to everything. However, however you want to mend it at this point, I got a feel of you and time and uh that was a great start just with princes i didn't anticipate that but i'm like really open so hey do do what you do and uh i got it i i'm i'm, I'm gonna give you i'm gonna give you uh the best that i have i really love your show so i really so want to get this to you here's a <clears throat> kind of abstract concept that is interesting to me so our show is about creative burnout. So, I mean, Tom and I started with all the freedom in the world, right? And we're able to choose a creative path 
that we both followed to the point where we both got very successful at this creative life we're living and then experienced burnout, which is, you know, a much smaller place. And you, you're sort of captive by this creative pursuit that you've done because you're making money from it. You don't have all the freedom in the world anymore, right? Because you're, you've chosen this path and gotten really far down it. And it seems to me like you had a very opposite experience of you experience kind of the burnout first, the closing of your, of your creative world first. And then um, I was reading about you creating your album and how all of these different constraints were put on you. You're in solitary confinement. You can only upload 15 seconds, like all of these tight, tight, tight things that really sort of led to freedom of your creativity. Is this making sense or am I on a wrong? Tom, say something. I I think Tracking. it makes sense. I'm, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I understand where you're going for, with that. I think what I'm interested in is how your creativity, Leon, changed, if at all, from before your incarceration to during your incarceration because I know I, I read a little bio about you and I know you're into sculpting you were into drawing comics as a kid all that stuff I also know you were a hustler you know um what what did your creativity look like before the conviction and then how did that change or evolve or mold into something different while you had all of this time in prison and in solitary confinement, did your philosophy change about what about creativity was interesting to you and what you wanted to put out into the world? Can you speak on that at all? Oh, definitely. You know, you know, growing up, you know, as a kid, uh, I went to a daycare center called Pie Piper in Flint, Michigan. Uh, I went there as early as four years old. And it was, you know, one of the the daycare uh, teachers or counselors, an older woman by the name of Miss Artson, I believe. And it was a, another teacher by the name of Hazel. Miss Artson was an older white lady with all like white hair. Like she was the archetypical like older white woman. And Hazel was like probably in her 30s back then. And Miss Arnson brought the sculpting thing to me because I, I was playing with clay. I never played with clay before, but I, I realized I was good with my hands and I made these dinosaur figures. And before I knew it, Miss Arnson, uh, she highlighted my art and put it up like in a daycare, like on display, like, look what Leon did. And then I would do shows for the other kids. And I was like, wow, you know. I'm really making something out of nothing. So that was the first time that I, I, I realized that you can create something out of nothing. And that fascinated me. And the thing about Hazel, Hazel introduced me to story, right? The art of storytelling. This woman would come and give me these stories. I was so fascinated. She used to make them up. And like, Leon, you own this this trip to space how do it feel to be in space leon i'm like i don't know you know <laughs> and <laughs> it really fast it really fascinated me and and this was my early start of understanding that you can create and i started to do other things around my home you know with drawing and i was getting some attention and i was like I, do i got some like you know i couldn't like believe it cuz it was like something so natural to me and they was really receptive, like people in my home. When I grew up, I was like the only person that like did art. Like I felt weird for a lot of years, but it was just something inside of me that just like to create something out of nothing. And eventually the spoken word, you know, out of the comic book drawings and things like that, the spoken word was something really big. This thing called hip hop, it really hit me. And I, I love the beat. And it was so creative, you know, because you can bounce your body. Now, I get where I'm coming from. I was already a kinetic artist, 
right? And then I liked it, the story. So now I get to dance and I get to tell the story at the same time. You know what I mean? So you get this, you know, intersection of uh, disciplines coming early without me even understanding it. So hip hop came and, uh, you know, I, I just freestyle like it just came to me. So I used to love to do it. And, and my earliest creation of it, after I heard the LL Cool J's and the Ron DMC's and it elevated to the NWA's and to the uh, two shorts, the E-40s, the Dayton families of what have you. And, and what happened was I wanted to hear myself. So the first thing I did, I got two radios, two cassette radios, one with record and the other one will play the beat. I find an instrumental and that's how I started recording. And I used to hear myself back. I was like, dang, I'm like, but is it really? Am I really ready? So I started letting other people hear it. And the feedback that I got, it really like empowered me because I'm like, I can inspire a thought. I can inspire stuff, right? I'm like, man, you know, I had never written formal poetry. I had any formal training in music or none. This is purely just coming out of me because of my enthusiasm of creating and then the side effect of what I got back from people. I'm like, if somebody said, man, that's whack. I'm like, why is that whack? I want to do it this way. But my thing is, I started to develop a purpose. In some way, you have to bend for your audience because you want them to get a particular message, right? And so, you know, I went on, I, 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 I recorded in a studio. Uh, I performed a lot. Uh, I was really, you know, doing my thing, pursuing it. And, you know, unfortunately, I got into the streets. But the creativity aspect of it was always there because my creativity came from a place of practicality. You know, even though when I was a child, I had a big imagination as a child as well. I played by myself when I was a child. But I, I had a lot of friends, though. Like, people used to love me, right? But I was like, I would call myself now a uh, ambervert, right? I was introverted and I was an extrovert and I'm still this way to this day. So I'm very lively, hey, but I can go in the corner by myself and do my thing. Uh, so coming out in the world, you know, I seen that thing and, you know, I start to apply my art to real life. So uh, I needed money, so. I, I used the initial tools that I seen that was around me. So I was an artist that was in a appeal house, you know what I mean? That was in a drug house, right? So I started to look around and see people like that. I'm like, wow. So I'm getting this same response. I'm like, if I come up with a creative way to make money, right? Which didn't initially start with me seeing the drugs. It started with me doing simple things like mowing the grass in my neighborhood and shoveling snow and raking leaves. So I was that guy before the drugs. See, I was a hustler early. I'm like, man, y'all sitting here, man. I, let me go knock on the door. How you doing, uh, Miss Hill? Well, my name is Leon. Would you like your, uh, your grass cut? $15 for the front and back. And they like, oh, you so cute. You know, I'm like, oh, I see something here, right? And Pumping I came, the chest out, got the shoulders back and everything. <laughs> shoulders back, right? And, 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 and I left away from that experience feeling very confident. But I learned the lesson. Like, I, I think I made, I was like 11 or 12 years old. I came in from, uh, I can't remember if it was shoveling snow or raking leaves. I think it was shoveling snow. And I made like $300, right? This is like 88, right? I got like $300, right? And I showed my mom. My mom like, oh, and she kept my money, right? I'm like, I ain't telling her no more. <laughs> so, you know, long story short, you know, I was really open. I didn't have no formal education of art. I think I attended a, a Michigan University drawing scholarship for a summer. And I drew like with pastels and stuff. And, you know, my contemporaries, I was the youngest guy in the class. I think I was like 12. Right. I submitted it and I got to do this 
little scholarship program for the summer. It was really fun and stuff. But I really didn't have no formal nothing. I was a kid that should have went to performing art school. It would have, I don't know who I would have became or seemingly so. So, you know, eventually, you know, my drug dealing got me pushed into prison. You know, moving moving forward in that, when I get to prison, I want to let you guys know something. Unlimitation is the enemy of art. It's true. You need limitation to really be creative. The limitation allows you to challenge yourself, right? So it's a limitation, for instance, like in hip hop. So I'm going to give you this whole world in 16 meters, a.k.a. bars, right? I'm giving you this. I'm, I got to write the minimum to express so much. But the art of it is that you're doing that. It's like a haiku. Like, how do you fit all this stuff in a haiku? Just seven lines. But it's that limitation. And, you know, coming to prison, I had that limitation and I had to navigate through it. And at first coming through with hip hop, you know, it was a thing. Guys beating on their chest. You know, that's what I gravitated to first. That's what I was doing. But it became a thing of art is edu educating yourself, right? And so I started to seek deeper education about history, where things came from, studying different disciplines. And most of that study came when I went into solitary. And it did come through at first with me trying to be a better, you know, hip hop artist, poet. I want to I want I want to introduce you guys to this. And this will frame everything. So as I started to dwell through history, I started to realize the power of entomology, the root meaning of words. So I was like, man, I discovered that a prophet in Hebrew is Naba. And what Naba means, an inspired speaker or singer. That's it. I'm like, wow. That's what that means, inspired speaker or singer. Now, get it. I'm a rapper, right? I'm an inspired speaker or singer. So I start to go up the ladder, and then we bump, in, we bump into Greek meaning of poet, poetase, which means creator, maker. I'm like, damn, what? And then we get to the poet where we giving out these words. So all these things intersected. So with me, grasping a deeper understanding of my craft as a poet right you know in other cultures in the african culture i would be what you call a griot I'm, I'm the guy that go to the villages and tell them about this epic adventure you know in storytelling or in a song but i'm conveying some i got a meaning so in prison what i developed was a deeper meaning of why I am doing this. And that really beat out the fatigue of fighting for my uh, uh, freedom, for my name, because I had a meaning. And so the meaning would be the equivalent of this. Let's look at this, your world as a solar system. Your meaning, your main meaning should be the sun in that solar system and everything else is just revolving planets. The planets that's the closest would be the ones of the most importance and so on and so on as it drifts out. So my meaning was I got to get free, but I pick a planet. I'm like, well, today I'm gonna write a brief today. So I'm gonna put that meaning in a brief. Well, today I'm gonna draw a picture. I'm gonna put that meaning in drawing a picture. Right. And then in the end, what's so fascinating for me was in the end, I can intersect all these things fluently. Right. And it's just it, it just it just unloads in such a way. And it comes from that discipline of living uh, in under those conditions. And so in, in prison, you have to be creative anyway. When you go to prison, you see a lot of creativity with what guys do. Like these guys are Picassos 
and he's going to give me this Picasso picture for a soup? I'm like, I can't believe it. I'm like, man, here go a soup, right? I mean, better artists than me in some regards, but art is in the eye of the beholder. You know, these guys that can write, draw a perfect picture, they say that my uh, abstract stuff is better than theirs. I'm like, what? Man, you, you perfect. But it's just in the eye of the beholder, your audience, you know. And just like James Baldwin said, the true artist is that of a lover because he would tell society what they don't see, right? He would show them what they can't comprehend so they can be better at what they do. And, you know, hopefully for every artist that's being a better, you know, human in, in whatever capacity that may be. So while inside, these are some of the things I gathered. And, you know, sitting in the solitary, now we talking about freedom. Okay. Yeah, I will admit. Yeah, I mastered the craft. So I'm where the chair to be, right? A little play on words for craft cheese. But what I'm saying is, okay, are you going to get mad at me? Like, I got I got some cell phones while I was on the inside, right? So I had to be creative to get that. I had to see this guard and, like, I had to pick up on some, like, yeah, this guard needs some money. Like, hey, we can help each other out. I'm like, Christmas is on the way. I'm dropping hints. they like, what do you mean? I say, call that number, you know, and you get this cell phone. You know, what's ironic about that, for us as creators and artists, uh, when I reached out to some of my supporters with a cell phone, some of them stopped supporting me. They said, you got a cell phone in prison. You ain't a good guy, Leon. Uh, I can no longer support your cause. I was like, damn, like what? I mean, <laughs> hey, what is Harriet Tubby came with a cell phone with the Underground Railroad? I got a cell phone. We calling the other slaves right now. We going to pass through. And what you think the abolitionists would have been like, Harriet, Black Moses, we, we can't deal with you no more because you got a cell phone and you was cheap. You're making it too easy on yourself, Harriet. <laughs> Yeah, it's too easy. It's supposed to be a struggle, Harriet. Come on, man. What are you doing? <laughs> right. What are you doing? So these things became apparent. I'm like, how do I do this? Like, how do I get my voice out? And it went through blogs, creative with that. But I thought that as society advanced with technology, with the use of the internet, I had to also advance too. And I felt like, I wrote so much. I put so many poems out and stuff like that. It was time for the world to really hear my voice. Like, hear me. Let me just speak to you. Like, I'm speaking to you now. I feel like if I just had a platform for an hour to, to be heard clearly, it would have changed the whole trajectory of my incarceration and my exoneration, you know. So these where these things come from. Uh, no limitation is the enemy to art. So I guess we got to go isolate ourselves sometimes to really get it. You know, the burnout, step away. Go another path away because it, it does burn you out. If I'm doing the same thing, I ain't getting no result, right? I can't just make art for myself. At some point, you know, the cathartic and, and sublimation of it all it just, it becomes meaningless. Like, ain't nobody hearing this. Like, why am I doing this? I'm just talking to myself. Am I crazy? But to get an impact from society, when somebody from society, you know, hears my voice when I was on the inside or read uh, my blogs or essays, that was powerful to me. That was a piece of freedom. And it allowed me to get outside of myself. The true artist. It's somebody that empathizes, right? You got to empathize with others. I'm like, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to, you know, you can be destructive, but I didn't want to do that. I, I, I wanted to impact, you know, people with my stuff. I wanted to uh, uh, solicit a certain response. Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. Sometimes it was lesser than what I was trying to do. Sometimes it was way more 
than what I was trying to do. And you always got to live with that, that people will take your stuff and interpret it the way they want, you know? Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Move Me Brightly podcast. Please don't forget to leave a review if you enjoyed. Part two of this conversation with Leon Benson will be out next Monday.